Hi, everyone. I hope you've all had a chance to have lunch and feel a little bit rested and energized. I know we're coming to the second half of the day. Um, I hope you come energized. My name is uh, Jacob Verne. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, EduMe. We've got a stand just here, other side, yellow, work for success with lots of Wimbledon stuff, tennis rackets and tennis balls. Um, if anything of what I'm saying is interesting to you, feel free to come around after and see me or my colleagues. I know that we're at Learning Technologies and we've been here before and I've spoken here before, um, but I'm going to do my very best not to talk about Learning Technologies. Um, I'm sure you're getting enough of this from all the stands and all the other talks, so I'm going to try to bring a fresh perspective. I'm going to try to bring some context to the reason I really think that we're all here and why we're engaged. First, though, I just want to make sure that everyone here is in the right place. So I have one question. It's just a simple, you can just raise your hand and if, you, if you agree. Do you want your workforce to be successful? Hands up. Anyone who wants their workforce not to be successful, hands up. And a few people didn't raise their hands. Not sure, do we want them to be successful? Maybe not. Um, but I think generally there is a consensus. That's great because it's encouraging. You're in the right place. I think what I'm going to talk about is going to be relevant to you. Um, and if you leave with only one takeaway from this presentation, it's workforce success. And if you don't remember it, it says on my t-shirt as well, and it says on the presentation, workforce success. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, we'll have, uh, I'll try to leave a few minutes for Q&A afterwards. Uh, if you have any questions, come, I'll, I'll stick around. You can ask me questions or, or you can come to the stand. And then if at the end of the day you're very tired, we're doing an unofficial after party at the Fox, which is next to Starbucks um, by the custom house entrance, 3 p.m. Wimbledon semis for the, for the women's. Unfortunately, Konza, she's out, but there are other good games going on. Um, and the drinks are on us, so that's another reason to come. All right, are we ready to dive in? This is Samantha. Samantha is from New York City. Samantha works for Uber, but she's never been to their office. She works out of her car. Samantha is one of four million people globally working for Uber. That's a pretty amazing number, right? 65 countries, six continents. Samantha and her co-workers, they all perform the same job, exactly the same job. Still, they've never met and they will never meet. They don't go to an office, they don't chat around the water cooler. They're all alone, but somehow they're still together, right? Because they work for the same company, they do the same thing. Now imagine for a second what kind of challenges and opportunities this brings. It's quite different probably from what most of you do and most of us do. <laughs> Uber is somehow the poster child of the gig economy. And it's easy, I think, to get comfortable and say, well, that's Uber and they're different. It's not really true for anyone else, but this is not the case. Uber is not the anom anomaly anymore. Uber represents the new normal, okay? And it's time not only to get used to that, um, but to prepare and even get ahead of the curve, because otherwise you're going to be left uh, on the sidelines. In fact, a majority of the global working population, they don't sit behind a desk. In fact, 2.7 billion people are desk-less, which I'm sure is kind of a big number that we don't really realize. New research shows that freelance workers may comprise as much as half of the US workforce by 2027. In Europe, freelancers are the fastest growing segment of the employment market. In the UK, the number of people estimated to work in the gig sector is 5 million people. So that's more than 50% of, of the total full and part-time workforce. So one in six jobs in the UK are in the gig economy. And if any of this sounds like that's a high number, 
Now reflect or raise your hand or nod your head. How many of you have met someone who was not a traditional employee today, yesterday, this week? How many of you make use of freelancer, freelancers or contractors in your line of work? How many of you took an Uber here today or are planning to leave in one? And uh, if you're not planning already, you can go to our stand because we're giving out £10 uh, Uber credits. The d uh, so we have one big thing that's, ha that's changing. So that's where we work. Now, the who is working, that's also changing. So the demographic of the workforce is being turned upside down. 75% will be millennials in just a few years. And not only do they think and appreciate other things, they have grown up doing things differently. And I won't poll you on how many of you are millennials, because uh, that might be considered uh, not too polite. But suffice to say, the definition is generally born 1981 or after, so I'm disqualified from that. Um, but I do have colleagues here who represent the millennial base. And they value learning and development very highly. In fact, it's one of their top priorities in choosing where to work and whether to stay. 43% of millennials expect to leave their jobs within two years. And according to Deloitte, 73% of young professionals who plan to stay with their employers for more than five years say that their organizations are strong providers of education and training. And this is because the role of the employer as an educator continues to take on significance. Among those millennials who would willingly leave their employers within the next two years, 62% regard the gig economy as a viable option. So why is that? Promise of higher income, uh, increased flexibility and freedom. And 81% of millennials state that self-paced learning will be important to help them perform at their best. Third mega trend, smartphones rule the world. This has been converted into a PowerPoint from Keynote, so that's why it's screwed up. The way we consume information and communicate has radically changed with the advent of the smartphone. I don't think we, most of us don't think about this, but mobile is the fastest growing technology in modern history. There are no f now 4 billion smartphone users. They outnumber PCs 2.5x. And now for some of the scary statistics. We check our mobile phones every 12 minutes. Not too many of you are doing it at the moment. Someone is. That's fine. Otherwise, you won't reach your statistics. Uh, two in five adults, so 40%, first look at their phones within five minutes of waking up, rising to 65% of those aged under 35, while 37% of adults check their phones five minutes before lights go out again, rising to 60% for under 35s, OK? So that's pretty, pretty insane. And if you agree with me that this sounds like almost not very healthy, and you're surely not part of this, I'm actually going to put you to the test. So I know how to do this on iPhone. I don't know on Android. Feel free to do. Are you familiar with the concept of screen time? So now everyone is allowed to do their once every 12 minutes. Pick up your phone, if you have an iPhone. And then go to Settings. I'm going to do a competition. When you're in Settings, you scroll down to Screen Time. It's on this second pane. And then you can look at how much time you're spending in your phone today or on a weekly basis. Okay? You can see how many times you're picking up your phone. You have to, pick, you have to also choose your, your, your iPhone. Okay? So if I poll you now and I say, hands up, if you're checking your phone, just scroll down to see how many times you're picking up on a weekly basis, last seven days. Who is checking their phone more than 50 times per day? Hands up. Anyone doing more than 100? Keep your hand up. No? Are we between 50 and 100? If you scroll up and I ask you, who is spending more than one hour on their phone on a daily basis? Okay. 
So keep your hand up if you're doing more than two. Three, four, five, six, seven. So did we have six? So last time I did this, it was seven hours. That's, that's quite a lot. And this is also where you see where you spend your time. So if you think that you're not using your phone that much, now you have the answer. So I'm going to connect this to the space that we're in. Okay, so these things are happening. Where we work is changing. Who is working is changing. How we work. Okay. What is the impact of this? Standing still. What happens if you have employees that are unengaged with your company, your products, your services? They're lacking in enthusiasm. They're not offering their best for their customers. So put simply, if you're not doing the best for them, they won't do the best for you. According to Gallup, 87% of employees worldwide are disengaged at work. Um, that's kind of scary. Productivity and profitability often suffers as a result. The opposite is also true. In businesses with highly engaged teams, Gallup found that profitability increased by 21%. Uh, uh, exactly. Sales productivity, 20%. Output quality by 40%. And absenteeism decreased by 41%. So think about what these statistics would mean for you and your business. So taking on board what I've said, are we ready? Does it make sense to say, okay, so this is how we work. These are the people. This is how we consume information. Let's schedule that next training session. Get everyone into the office, one, two, six, seven days uh, of training. Or let's fire up that old desktop computer and sit through 40 minutes with your mouse and click through and watching something and not really checking. Does it sound engaging or scalable or sustainable? So your workforce, they expect that their 9 to 5 is going to look more like their 5 to 9, i.e. their leisure time. When it comes to seamless, effortless experience, largely enabled by technology. It's important to recognize that everyone who's working for you, they have their own lives. They're influenced by their B2C experiences. They listen to music using Spotify. They order food, food, food delivery. So you need to think about also, how do we deliver our services to our workforce? Why should that be any different? Why should that be more or less convenient or less conven uh, accessible? Work for success. So jobs are shifting into non-traditional industries to positions that are not desk-based. We've got shorter attention spans, but more information to take in. Deloitte research shows that employees take only 25 minutes per week to actually slow down and learn on a weekly basis. So the people working are also different with new priorities and ways of doing things. And whilst this is happening, there's an ever-increasing need to upskill people to reskill people, to stay competitive, and to ensure that your company ob objectives are met. So there's this barrage of information, and I need to surface the most relevant information from the all the noise that surrounds us. This information has to be very accessible at the point of need and serve short attention spans. This is best done through short form content, engaging ways that fits with the way that we work and the way that we consume information. So faced with these facts, what's the most appropriate response from companies that want to future-proof their business? How do you empower your ever-changing workforce so they can access the information they need and acquire the skills they require to perform at their best regardless of where they perform their job? So starting with learning opportunities, I think we can rule out a complete reliance on face-to-face, -face, which is not attainable at scale. Putting people in front of traditional clunky, old, boring e-learning solutions is not engaging. It doesn't deliver knowledge retention. So for me and for us, that's a thing of the past. When it comes to communicating with your modern workforce, emails are not accessible by everyone uh, in the types of, of jobs that are created. 
popular tools like WhatsApp that we all use, they don't really scale, they're not consistent in terms of how you use them. So by now, I think everyone is familiar, most people are familiar with the concept of customer success. The goal of customer success is to ensure that your customers achieve their desired outcomes using your product or services. And similarly, the goal of workforce success, it's pretty straightforward, but it's a more comprehensive framework. So by now, I've shared a lot of like, big changes. I don't know if it excites you or scares you, or there's a little bit of both. But I guess the main question to ask here is, are you ready? So let's get into some practical examples. I'm going to base the, uh, these around the work that we've done with, with Uber across four continents. Um, we also work with companies like Airbnb, Deloitte, and Vodafone. I think it's applicable to any modern organization. What we go through next. So turning the lens to Uber. I think, again, tying back to what I started talking about, global megatrends, it, this exemplifies this very well. Their workforce is dispersed. They're typically younger. They're only available on their phones. They're not going to come into the office. They're not going to sit in front of a desktop computer. So the new normal. To some specific best practices, what we've done with Uber, onboarding. How do you actually onboard so many new people on a constant basis and provide a consistent, coherent approach so you know they're going to go out, all 4 million of them in 65 countries, six continents, all being different, and actually delivering a consistent service to the end client? One, you have to provide a baseline for your workforce. Answer the following questions. What does your organization do? How is it different from competition? Who are your founders? What's your story? Who is your C-suite? What are their stories? What are your growth plans? How are you going to achieve them? This is a nice place to add a personal touch. If there is a video from a founder, from a C-level executive, from a CEO, so you're buying into some, something, someone who you never actually meet in person anymore. Convey the values and culture of your company is very important. You create excitement, a sense of belonging, which is harder to do in today's world. It often gets lost in the rest of the kind of more technical and compliance-related parts of onboarding. A great way to do this is through short videos of employees talking about their experiences. And if it's not an employee, it's part of your workforce. What do they like about working at your company? What does a typical day look like? What differentiates it from other places where they could work? It's very encouraging for new starters to hear from their colleagues and peers. So for example, at Uber, they use driver personal stories that they share with others because that makes it really relatable and engaging. Like, yeah, I'm doing this and I'm alone, but actually all of these other people are doing the same thing. Don't do talking heads, don't do slides, make it real. And then provide the basics to hit the ground running. So increasingly so, like we have less time to get going. And it can feel, no matter what you do, overwhelming to start a new job. So keep it short and focused on what people really need to know at the beginning of their journey and then follow up on that. So make it a regular training, a regular habit of coming back that fits into busy schedules. Even today, I've had several discussions where it's like, yeah, we onboard and then we bring people in and we do that for a week or two weeks and then they're kind of left to their own devices and we don't really know what's happening. Of course, this is not going to work when you have this constant turnover of people and this constant need to upskill. Again, I would reinforce like videos, great tool. You can, you can share a lot of information. They convey a lot of information in short time. They also provide authentic context and scenarios to boost learning and retention. So this is about onboarding. Practical examples about communication. Seven of these that I'm going to rattle through. Welcome onboarding. For perfect opportunity to share your culture, values, background of your products and services, reinforcing key information that employees received during this 
original onboarding training. Um, it will enable your workforce to hit the ground running. Two, news and updates. Whether it's countdown to important events, upcoming kind of software, system, product launches, changes to your app, changes to your product, comms that ensure that everyone is up to speed. You can also create time sensitive information to make sure that only the most relevant information reaches them. Product information, share feature benefits, USPs, guidelines, pricing, new products, short kind of digestible uh, information. If there's lots of in information, build like short lessons. If you're using micro learning something else, three, five minutes long, use communications to reinforce that learning. Four, team building, social. Also very important when you have a dispersed workforce, great opportunity to share stories from, uh, from around the world, from across the company. You can include like team pictures, staff profiles, trivia, even general interest stories. This is a more engaging and personal uh, approach to create a balance between learning and the communication. Motivation and incentives is the best way to ensure success of your training uh, program. Being recognized for hard work or for achievements when there's not a pat on the back because you don't meet in the office. Research shows that when we're not acknowledged, we lose a lot of our motivation. I mean, it sounds like a no-brainer, but it's probably worth reinforcing that. Recognizing staff members when they reach their goals, it builds trust and loyalty, it encourages others to reach their goals as well. It ensures that teams are motivated, that they're engaged. Polls and surveys, um, use communications to run polls and surveys. They can link back to feedback, user assessment, tips, collect best practices from a dispersed workforce. And lastly, brand and company information. So we have a stat here, only a shockingly low 40% of employees know their company's goal. It's kind of hard to deliver at your best consistently if you don't know what the goal is. So it's super important to clarify purpose, positioning, proposition, share company history values, make people understand what they're buying into. It's going to make them a lot more engaged. It's going to make them more productive and more loyal. It sets the tone of the organization when people otherwise could feel easily isolated. So you have to share, like, why is your place such a great place to work? How do you increase productivity in workforce? Tying back to what we've done with Uber, but on a more general level. You provide highly accessible and engaging upskilling opportunities. You surface relevant information at the right time to the right person. You've, you've got to cut through the noise. And you have to empower your workforce to succeed on their terms. Remember that they have their own experiences, their own ways of doing things. So telling them to do it in a different way doesn't make any sense at all. You have to meet them on their home turf. And this is where workforce success comes in and what workforce success encompasses. Like I said, to finish off, we're at stand five, just behind here, yellow, tennis rackets. Here's one of our tennis players of the day. Uh, we're hosting an unofficial after party from 3 p.m. at the Fox. Uh, so you're very welcome. We've got free drinks tickets over at the stand. And I'm actually going to finish up now. Maybe I did a lot less than 30 minutes, but I'm sure you're tired of listening to people. So open for any questions now or later if you want to come over to the stand. Thank you very much for listening. And, and, and follow these guys and gals with the, with the white shirts if you want drinks tickets or a signed autograph. No, not the last one. Thank you.